constitution Join the revolution Lawful rebellion now writes the British constitution We stand for good show we control Our heritage lies in free men's souls We fight to call Okay, and here we go. Well, thanks, Brian, for coming into uh, the Lawful Rebellion UK Pal Talk Room uh, tonight. And I'm going to start off in a traditional UK column uh, fad and ask you, how's the weather in Plymouth? Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's made me laugh. Um, it's um, it's a cold night, and I think there's going to be a big frost. Clear sky, frosty. Okay, brilliant. Let's get into business then. First question is quite a long one, Brian. Um, George M. Twistle has resigned as Director General of the BBC and Lord McAlpine has supposedly been wrongly accused by Newsnight. Taking into account Jimmy Savile, does this indicate panic status in the paedophile ranks and, and the start of a projected cover-up? Uh, well, this is a pretty easy question for me because um, my answer to this is absolutely. I, I think that there is... There is absolute uh, panic in the ranks of the elite paedophiles. And, um, of course, the first thing to say is that uh, um, Lord McAlpine, um, the, the allegations that were made about the, um, the Welsh care home, those are one thing. Uh, sorry, that's one thing. And I, have, I do not know whether he did something there or not. What I do know is that if you look at the article that was originally written by uh, the editor of Scallywag magazine many years ago, and I have a copy of that article, the, the article is extremely detailed in making very serious allegations um, against uh, Lord McAlpine and other senior members of the, of the government at the time in relation to young rent boys. So I believe that what we're seeing is a smoke screen. So he can he can squeal that no, he, he hasn't done anything wrong in this case. But if we go back into his history and look at the depth of the the work that was done by Scallywag, um, he certainly doesn't appear to be clean to me. And the second point is uh, that um, certainly the mail today um, raised a question of a very interesting link between the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which was used by Newsnight to do the um, investigation into the Lord McAlpine um, scandal. Uh, what the Mail is pointing out is that there is a direct link between the Bureau of Investigative Journalism and Leveson, and that link comes by the fact that Lord um, Bell, uh, who is not, who was until he stepped down temporarily from the Media Standards Trust, so he's common purpose. He was chair of trustees for the Media Standard Trust. Uh, he helped set up the Hacked Off campaign, which has pushed for media uh, uh, greater control of the media. And now it transpires that uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, uh, that Sir David Bell is also one of their trustees. And yet this was the very organisation used by Newsnight to actually set up the story on, um, on uh, Lord McAlpine. So my view is that the complete thing has been a set up in order to um, uh, uh, blur obfuscate and confuse the whole picture of um, the senior government paedophiles which uh, who were there in the background in the Jimmy Savile case. Yeah I tend to agree Brian I can't pick any fault up on that. Um, somebody was speaking to me early on today and saying that George Entwistle um, he could well have been put into the BBC as a precautionary measure that they knew that uh, the Jimmy Savile case was going to break and basically become a scapegoat. Um, what role has Chris Patton, as a matter of interest, got to do in all of this? Well, again, I, I'm, uh, what I'm giving is opinion. Um, Chris Patton, in my view, is dirty. That's why he was used to um, help the final close down of Hong Kong. Um, one of the things going on in the background as Hong Kong was closed down was the 
uh, removal of a lot of gold bullion. That's a story in itself. Uh, but of course, the other thing about Chris Patton is he's absolutely a common purpose man. So we've got the position that a, that a common purpose man has been made head of the BBC. And then we've got Sir David Bell, the lead figure via the Media Standards Trust in attacking uh, the press and the media. And I, I think what we've got is um, a two pronged attack. So the um, uh, the phone hacking scandal has been used to actually attack and attempt to control the press and this particular scandal has now been used to absolutely reduce the BBC to chaos and of course what they're saying is well the BBC needs to have a, a um, uh, reduced and slimmer management structure well of course if that is underpinned by extra government controls then we've very nearly gone into the position of, of total state control of the media and press. Um, but Patton is, is dirty everywhere you look, and I think it's his common purpose connections which does it for me. Okay, thanks. Brian, what's, what's transpired out of the Lord McAlpine thing is that basically, um, from what we can seem to gather, one of the witnesses who had already made statements uh, believing Lord McAlpine was involved in the North Wales child abuse scandal has retracted his evidence. Now, what we seem to be picking up on this is that he was shown a photograph, and when he was shown a photograph, he said, oh, that's not the guy that actually abused me. Now, considering we're going back 30-odd years plus, don't you find it a little bit strange that he'd never actually seen what Lord McAlpine looked like um, in the papers since the time of the abuse, etc., etc.? Um, do you think this witness could possibly be a plant for the state, has maybe been bought off or even threatened with, uh, threatened with death by the establishment? Um, well, I think this is completely possible, and I think the first thing to say about him is that the key bit is that nobody has said that he is not a victim of abuse. So we, we go back to this man who was abused as a child, there's no doubt about that, and therefore that would have, in my opinion, affected his um, thinking and personality. Uh, the papers have, have been labelling him as um, unreliable, uh, and that he stood trial for £65,000 fraud at a charity. Uh, but of course what the papers are not reporting is that he was actually found not guilty of that fraud. And when they talk about him losing his temper at the original inquiry, my mind says that this is exactly the expected reaction from somebody who has been abused. He's been let down by the state and the police in the original um, situation because the abuse of those children was, nev was never investigated properly. So he would have been an angry man anyway. He's then put in front of a judge. Uh, my opinion at the moment is that the paedophile judges are being used to close down these investigations. So it doesn't surprise me at all that this man would be um, up and down in his personality, angry, and of course he he's entitled to make mistakes everybody can but um, I think yes he's I think it's more likely that he's actually been threatened what do you want to do do you want to live or somebody's going to find you in a ditch I think that's more likely than the fact that they've they've actually raped somebody up as a, as a government stool pigeon if that's the right word yeah, I must admit, Brian, I agree uh, with you, everything you've said on there. Um, two questions that do come out of it, and maybe you'd like to just give us your answer on this. Um, everything now seems to be done by trial by newspaper, for one, and actively. Why are the police not playing any sort of active role in these investigations at the moment? Because surely, you know, with allegations, etc., that we've got... Um, being tabled, it should be the police that should be doing the investigating and not the newspapers. Well, I, I would qualify this, this um, your question by saying that, that, in my opinion, what we've got is paedophilia, which is so ingrained 
uh, not only in society but the top of the establishment so I'm talking through the judiciary through Westminster and through the police um, that uh, the police can't be let loose on it um, because there are good policemen and if, if they basically really gave the police a free reign I know at the moment that there are police who are champing at the bit to get at these people who they know have been pro uh, protected um, if, if I've forgotten the police officer's name the senior one who's been made lead of the uh, the children's home inquiry but he is common purpose and I find that particularly interesting because the man who was sent over to Jersey who completely um, undermined all of the initial investigations into the abuse which has been done uh, and then c effectively closed the Jersey Haute de la Gren investigation down he was also common purpose so I, I think the problem is that, that the um, well it, it is my opinion that uh, the the child abuse in this country the trafficking the prostitution the abuse and worse is actually being run through the organizations we believe are there to protect families and children the police are involved in it the judiciary are involved in it the uh, Westminster is involved in it and the trouble with um, with uh, this Savile case is I think it's exploded a lot faster and wider than they expected so what they're going to try and do now is to keep each allegation compartmentalized where they can send in their corrupt police or corrupt judge in order to close it down well, Brian obviously you're on a much bigger scale than me and I think everybody in the room would like to thank you for the good work that you're doing um, I get um, fed obviously through Neath but Albert Council, you're familiar with the Linda Lewis case, um, the, the odd snippet of information comes through from social workers and the odd policeman or somebody who's just basically hacked off completely at the Ill illegality that they're seeing going on by, as you say, common purpose people further up uh, the, the, the employment ladder. Um, obviously without giving names etc just how much information are you getting at the moment from disillusioned employees of for example the police force social services the army etc are you getting a pretty good stream of information coming in and just as importantly you know are the dots beginning to uh, to be joined right well the answer to that is a very positive one because we are getting good information in um, uh, I can tell you that I have met with um, police officers I will just say at the London end um, uh, what is interesting is the first time I met with them was a couple of years ago they were telling me um, about uh, the paedophile rings in London they were telling me that they'd been involved in investigations uh, to try and break those rings open they had discovered that uh, very senior people in the government were involved at high level and then they talked to me about having submitted their investigations with the um, follow-up um, action so apparently when they do a, an investigation they also have to submit a plan for, for dealing with what they're finding uh, and they talked about submitting their plan and then nothing happening and then a couple of months later their senior officer summoning them in and saying I'm afraid we're going to drop the investigation and when they asked why um, they weren't given an answer until they were eventually told just you know shut up otherwise you're going to be in trouble now that's what they were prepared to tell me two years ago uh, more recently uh, they put a lot more meat on the bones about how the rings were operating in London and uh, when I said yes but last time when I said to you what are you going to do about this you said to me well we got families and mortgages this time they said well things are changing because more of our colleagues are now pissed off that they realize that that our own senior officers are helping to protect paedophiles so that's my personal uh, or part of my personal experience with the police from the London end 
but I can tell you that in the Midlands and um, um, Tony Farrell of course has got his own contacts with the Midlands police uh, but we've also got uh, uh, people um, down in the Devon and Cornwall district and we are getting a similar report so basically there are a lot of police who have endured um, closure and blockages on investigations into what's happening to the children but they now see um, a chink in the armour with, with um, um, Jimmy Savile and they now are starting to push uh, to get this lid off so we're getting very good information from the police um, information from the armed forces is a bit more difficult because they're all frightened rabbits of being caught to talking politically um, but I can give you a very good example of what is happening at the moment um, and that is uh, we had a, a young Royal, Royal Marine who was recently retired uh, down in Plymouth um, he was sentenced to prison for trying to see his children um, very quickly he had 32,000 people on his on his Facebook page and we know that uh, troops overseas in Af Afghanistan are following what we are all doing so there is no question that, that what we do is actually being uh, is being picked up by serving troops uh, but of course they're, they're always very very nervous about getting involved in anything which which could obviously be used against them. I mean, from my own experience, you were constantly told that whilst you are in service, you can't be politically involved. But I, I think that the truth is beginning to spread very quickly. Um, we have social service whistleblowers, and we're also getting people from the NHS now talking to us. And what's interesting is that these people are further up the chain now. In the beginning, they would tend to be, um, I'm not being demeaning here, they'd be an ordinary social worker or maybe a nurse in the hospital. Um, now we're getting consultant level um, talking to us. So I, I think people are beginning to pick up and the quality of the whistleblowers is improving. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thanks, Brian, for that. Um, just one uh, final question, which ties into what you've just spoken about. I'm sure you're aware, Brian, um, we've, we've concentrated on social services. Um, we've also gone through MPs, politicians, uh, the judiciary, etc. Um, I remember when I met you quite a few years back for the first time that uh, I think you were touching then on a paedophile ring in South Wales, which was mainly... Uh, to do with the police force, um, if I remember correctly, the Terry Grange scandal. Have you heard anything at all? Because uh, we've got a couple of people in from, from South Wales tonight. Have you heard anything at all? Is there still pressure being put on um, the sort of Terry Grange and the David Powys police paedophile ring? Well, the, the answer is I can't tell you a lot because, because I don't know. But what I, what I do know is that in all the police um, areas, police are now beginning to talk about these things themselves and and this is what we need so the answer is I haven't got any up-to-date information I can share with you about that what I am absolutely positive about is the fact that paedophile rings across the country are being controlled not only through ch child protection but the police are intimately involved in it um, if, if I take the um, uh, the case of the three-month-old baby with the lady Emma in um, South Wales I went into a local police station um, to um, the baby had been taken the three-month-old boy had been taken I went into a local police station to say this child is going to be abused I was tr treated I had a witness with me a lady we, we were treated like dirt and effectively we ended up coming out of the police station you know just wondering what we were dealing with later when we had photographic evidence that that child had been uh, abused and with two witnesses we went into a larger Plymouth police station to report what had been done to that child whilst in the hands of, of, of um, um, South Wales Social Services um, in the interview room there was a police sergeant obviously an older man 
and a younger policeman the police sergeant eventually shouted at me in particular but it was aimed really at all of us to get out of his interview room get out of my interview room and it was it was just amazing to watch here was this man getting very angry almost abusive why because we were reporting that a child was abused now I think this reaction is created by the fact that that he knows that what we're saying is true and he also knows the police are connected to that abuse yeah I agree Brian I personally know from my own experience having to, had to make a couple of statements in uh, police stations etc with normal bobbies and things and when you get to start to talk to them um, they are all pretty decent people pretty demoralized totally pissed off at their superiors etc etc and a lot of them are finding themselves in positions where they don't want to be I mean one police officer when I had to make a statement over threats that I was getting quite a while back said to me he said social services are just evil bastards and it's horrible what's going on and that was just a normal copper that uh, I was told that privately to in a room okay well thanks for that Brian next question I've got here is uh, Philip Schofield told Cameron it took him only three minutes to find these names and then he handed it across to David Cameron. What do you think uh, Philip Schofield was trying to do there and what was he trying to achieve? Well, this is a very interesting question because I'm, I'm also thinking about it and uh, tomorrow I'm going to certainly have a good read through articles in the paper about him again. Um, I'm going to say what some other people have said to me is they actually feel that he was being genuine of course he didn't do three month three minutes research on the internet because there were three different lists of these paedophile names being circulated uh, and certainly the ones I had were complete with pictures and quite detailed paragraphs explaining uh, why the people were considered to be paedophiles and I know that certainly two of those lists was were sent to virtually every media channel in the country so I don't think he even had to go looking for it I think what he was doing was reacting to the list of paedophiles and indeed one list had a, had a, about four pages attached of people within the political parties who, who've already been convicted for child abuse offences so I, I think that Schofield had got that list it probably shocked him and um, he decided to go for it to see what the what Cameron's reaction was now that's that's a sort of benevolent um, view of the story what other people have pointed out to me is that when that list was handed across Cameron didn't really bat an eyelid he, 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 he went straight into his well we mustn't go into a witch hunt here and so other people have said to me that that Cameron's ultra cool reaction um, rather indicates that the whole thing was a set up job uh, now what what is very interesting is I learnt yesterday that Schofield and Paxman live in the Oxford area pretty close to where all of the rest of the Cameron um, team live um, uh, there was a particular phrase used used for the area in, in one of the reports in the papers uh, probably um, at the beginning of Cameron's um, uh, um, period in office um, and it called them the something elite but essentially uh, within a short a very small area just outside of Oxford not only is Cameron's constituency there in Whitney but also um, uh, you've got Rebecca Brooks was there you got Freud um, and now you've got Paxman just down the road and this guy as well so at the moment I don't know but I think I'm tending to the side that actually he was he was trying to do the right thing and uh, put a big spanner in the works okay I mean that that's interesting that you've got Paxman and Philip Schofield living quite close to each other in the Oxford area there um, because at the moment I believe Brian I've forgotten the name of the college you are investigating um, a sort of child abuse ring in one of the colleges in Oxford 
Um, just another quick question about this. Richard Littlejohn described uh, Philip Schofield as nonce finder general. What do you think of that? Well, I, I picked up this on, on one of the UK column lives we've done. I think that was the most pathetic article by Little John I've ever read because in the whole article he does not address child abuse and, and what I said at the time when we reported this is that I don't think Little John has a clue about the number of children involved in this or what they actually do to the children because if he did I just do not see how we could come out with this arrogant, smug, uh, pathetic criticism of um, Schofield. Uh, I'd really like to see Little John taken to task over this because the arti that article that he wrote, in my opinion, was an absolute disgrace. Yeah, I, ab I absolutely agree with you. I mean, Little John, if my facts are correct, I think he now lives in America pulls in about £800,000 of a salary and uh, is not in the slightest bit interested in the truth but is quite happy just to sit there and rake in um, you know, his, his massive salary and try and be a little bit controversial. Uh, coming back to Felix Schofield and David Cameron, apparently people have identified five names on the card that Cameron gave him. Um, a lot of us think, myself included, that at the end of that little 30-second interview, Cameron referred to he didn't want a witch hunt against gays. Do you think that was uh, a diversionary problem, again, to take everything away from uh, paedophilia? And the final question on this one, Brian, just as a little link, is how accurate do you consider the list that's out there at the moment of uh, paedophiles? How accurate do you consider it to be? Okay, well, if, if we do the first one, which is the, um, the gay bit, <clears throat> I, I think the trouble is that Cameron knows too much. Um, I have tried to be fairly, um, uh, what's the word, even-handed on the subject of gays because um, I do not agree uh, with the act, which is the, which is the key thing. I absolutely do not agree with that. Uh, but I can also accept there are people who are gay who have still um, got a morality and an honesty uh, which is as good as the rest of us. Um, so um, I think he was just too quick with that. It was either extremely clever which was to put a smoke screen over the whole thing and enrage all the gays um, but what I am told by people who know a lot more about this mucky subject than, than I do is that it is an unfortunate fact that male homo homosexuals are very predatory and that they are, um, are much more likely to be approaching young boys. And of course, if you look at Peter Tatchell um, he, uh, from Stonewall, um, he is on record as saying that his friends have slept with uh, 13, 12, 13, 14 year olds and of course it didn't hurt those youngsters at all. So I, I'm afraid I have to say that I see that the, um, uh, the, uh, the drive to get homosexuality accepted is part of the slippery slope to actually uh, saying, well, actually, it's okay, they're 14, they're 13, they're 12, oh, now we're accepting paedophilia. And, of course, that brings us right back to the likes of Harriet Harman, who was tied in uh, via what was, uh, well, it's now Liberty, it was previously the National Council for Civil Liberty, uh, where they were linked into both information exchange and also paedophile action for liberty. Moving on just very quickly, a nice little easy question for you. How is the UK column newspaper doing? Is it growing? And roughly how many copies are sold per edition? Uh, right, well the good news is that the thing is definitely growing. Uh, but I'm going to say the thing which has made um, a huge difference are these live programmes. We, we, ever since we started the UK column live, uh, we're getting a really good response. And... Um, people taking subscriptions is going up and as a result of that um, what we are going to do we're, we're shortly going to make an announcement about this 
but we are going to um, produce the paper quarterly and we are going to so we're going to lead information with the live programs and then basically the paper will be used to produce a written um, um, uh, what's the word a written record of the key articles that we're pushing out live um, we, we have been really surprised at the positive response since we've been doing the UK column live transmissions and and we I'm going to say we're getting quite excited at what we seem is possible um, so we've already updated um, equipment we will now or in the next week we'll be able to do live programs with three separate Skype video calls coming in and we're looking for a telephone stacking system to get live calls in so the paper has done us extremely well um, the most we ever printed in a month was 80,000 that was back in the early days um, we've been averaging about hmm, 35 sometimes 40,000 um, but but we've reduced the number we're printing because we've been getting better uh, better value from giving them to people who are doing something with them we discovered that maybe some people were taking several hundred copies but not really doing anything with them so we prefer the papers to be sent out to targeted people uh, rather than just necessarily given out freely okay well that, that's brilliant news Brian that leads on to another question that's come in not everyone is on the internet should we take it upon ourselves to advertise to the UK column door to door and do you have a facility to cope with that if we went ahead and did it um, well if you if you're talking about um, doing door to door and trying to get somebody to take a subscription out um, yeah we, we can definitely cope with that we, we, we are going to keep the hard copy edition because ultimately that has worked from the beginning um, we we know that the paper is read inside Parliament we know Cameron absolutely hates us um, and also more recently some of the old editions where we've had particular articles I've been giving those to the police for example or, or people in the military and getting a good response so paper in your hand is important um, if we if we got more people taking a subscription for say a quarterly edition that that would be very helpful to us yeah the power of the paper is um, well it's very powerful it's it's actually um, a great weapon to have in the fight because I mean I can testify myself that uh, when you printed the Linda Lewis case on the UK column um, great panic was had in social services and in Neath but Albert Council such to the point that they actually demanded that the papers no longer came in there so brilliant on that one Brian another quick question um, how quickly are pe people waking up and are we getting there um, right that's an easy question um, my opinion is that people are starting to wake up very quickly uh, what's doing it is that they're starting to to be hurt and what I mean by that is that you've either got people who've lost their jobs and and obviously there's a lot of job losses still to come in the public sector so you've got people losing their jobs or their children haven't got jobs or they've lost jobs and people are now also being affected by the the rise in prices particularly food prices and people are being affected by the way they are treated um, well the police are one thing but a lot of people comment now on how they feel they're being treated like dirt if they go into a job center for example so the calls that we get in uh, more and more people are saying you know we, we've come to you because we're, we're seeing what you're talking about and we agree because we've experienced this or that I felt that there's been a huge change over the last uh, over the last year but the last six months in particular I know Ian Crane um, is finding the same uh, Ike is finding the same virtually everybody who's out on the circuit is reporting that they're finding audiences are easier to talk to and I I often measure things locally by what people say to me in my area my village people who were taking the piss out of me uh, four years ago 
um, are now coming to me and quietly saying actually what you've been talking about is happening and then they ask me my opinion on various things so I think it's it's starting to happen um, just because it's on screen in front of me somebody Richard Veronikov um, is talking about how we're going to or asking about how we're going to prevent divide and conquer happening in Britain and uh, it's a very good question so if I can just pick up on it um, uh, I think that we've just we have got to show that we are prepared to work with anybody who is a reasonable and who is is not on the bad guy's side I think this is really important I went over to Dublin um, uh, weekend up before last and met up with uh, obviously some of the Irish team TNS radio but there were some great people who came across from Scotland um, uh, so there was a, a crowd of us and of course we had Irish from south of the border we had people from north of the border Northern Ireland and everybody was there saying we have got to start working together to deal with these people the, the Scottish boys were saying everything that Salmon was coming out with was a load of bollocks um, excuse my French and um, uh, I think the key to keeping people together is that we've got to show that we're prepared to work with them and I can tell you that um, I'll, I'll throw this one in see what reaction we get but we put the the Asian gentlemen on the front page of the UK column with regard to Oxford and Cherbal Valley College uh, if if you'd like me to tell you more about that uh, particular case I'm happy to do it but we we did have a few people who knew what we were going to do and they were very concerned at the reaction in fact we've had a brilliant reaction from people because they have started to see that the the, the you know the the bad people we're up against they want violence and strife wherever they can get it if it's black and white they want it if it's uh, Protestant and Catholic they want it if it's Muslim and or Asian and white they want it so if you want to stop the country being broken up we have to grit our teeth at the moment we we might feel that you know we need border controls I think we do um, but what we can't do is attack the people who've been invited in um, and that's that is my opinion as to how we stop the breakup we've got to be friends with everybody we can if they help us fight the real criminals that are in government yeah I agree with uh, most of what you said there Brian we've got no problem at all another question that's come in is quite simply is it time as a people to go on the attack are the elite cracking and how do we go about it most effectively well I think it's absolutely the time to go on the attack um, I think that the establishment has never been in a situation like they're in now where so many people have got the information about them and what they're doing and of course this has been the success of the internet so that they, they are they are finding attacks are coming in at all directions you've got people challenging the courts people challenging council tax people challenging the police uh, people calling um, uh, for traitors and talking about treason uh, now we're we're seeing the the pedophiles being exposed so finally there are lots of attacks coming in from the the public I believe the art at the moment is to do everything anything and everything which does not involve violence and um, uh, the reason for this is that the other side is absolutely set up to deal with violence because that's what they're trying to create if we keep things peaceful but we're absolutely ruthless I believe David Cameron is a liar I believe he's a criminal I believe he's prepared to cover up for paedophiles we have got to start getting in the faces of these people whether they're politicians or judges or senior police officers and they have got to be personally exposed not once a month it's got to be so that they don't want to get out of bed in the morning because they know that somebody else is going to be on their backs I can tell you um, that in a village in South Wales in the last few days uh, 
this is sad and we should consider it sad but somebody who has been involved in some rather st strange things has committed suicide and I believe that that has partly come about because that person has been interfered with um, by reframing so they've been drawn into something inherently dangerous with behavioral modification but they've then been exposed and talking to people trained in psychology and psychiatry the people we're up against if you expose them they can't take it so we we need to make everything personal it's no good saying that we're unhappy with neath port talbot council it's got to be naming the individuals uh, we don't talk about the government we talk about the ministers in government everything is made personal we put photographs everywhere together with the information about the person in question and and i think that we may not agree with with what we're all doing we'll have some differences but if people are going in the right general direction you encourage them and you let them do their thing you don't try and draw it into one big organization yeah i'm really delighted that you said that brian i thought i've been thinking for quite a while now that um we've got these um for want of a better word bastards on the run and uh, they ha I keep saying in the Lawful Rebellion room that uh, even though the odds always seem to look against us, um, I feel like I'm quite happy to be on this side of the fence because there's a, a great deal of fear, etc., on the other side of the fence at what we can expose and what we're finding out on a daily basis. Um, I agree with you there about the Sol Solalinsky, I think it's number five, and that is basically making it personal, go for the juggler on them, and let's expose these people for what they are. Moving on, just another question, slightly on the same theme. Um, how can we increase the pressure on the MSM to start telling the truth? Um, right, well, I think we're, we're already starting to make progress on this. Um, uh, I wrote to the editor of one of the national papers about six, seven months ago, I sent him information to do with Leveson. Um, I just wrote the letter very quickly one afternoon, very polite letter. I never expected to get anything back from it. To my utter amazement, about three weeks later, I got a personal handwritten letter back from him and it was quite clear that he'd read the information. And I'm going to say that I believe that since then I've been reading some articles in that particular paper where the the information they're using has clearly come from the uk column and other people yeah and um we also um are are seeing that other people involved in the media patrick henningson is is just one i'll say at the moment as an example but he's got contacts into people in the mainstream media and they are watching what we're doing and talking about. I'll give you a good example of this, that when just before the G4S scandal broke, there was an MP who is recorded in Hansard as saying in Parliament, of course there's a problem with G4S. The alternative media have been reporting it for 20 days. So the silence of, of the mainstream media is um, is uh, is ridiculous. Now that was a brilliant um, statement because it showed that there was a politician who was who was looking at alternative media, and I I know for a fact that serious journalists, Booker, certainly one of them, is looking at the material all of us are making available. So what we've got to do is keep pushing the information into the press. And of course, if Leveson is allowed to bring in his state control of the press and media, um, the average press hack is not going to have a job much longer. So I, I think we've got to be pointing out to them what their future is going to be if they don't fight for a free press. Yes, some great points there. I did actually read about Christopher Booker of The Telegraph um, last week um, that he had indirectly been threatened 
by a High Court judge, Brian. I don't know if you saw this. And basically told to calm down on um, what exactly he's saying about uh, social workers and the way children's services are going. Have you heard the same? Can you confirm it? Well, I can absolutely confirm that because um, uh, I, <coughs> excuse me, I've spoken to Booker personally. Um, he had to admit that he could not print some of the stories that he wants to because he gets warned off by the. Um, legal team in the Telegraph and he knows that they do that because they get pressure put on them uh, via the um, you know the legal old boy network so Booker has been very very open in talking about the pressure through from the judiciary to, to stop the mainstream papers talking and yes one judge in particular got so stroppy with him he you know started to threaten uh, with putting Booker in prison if he didn't shut up. Now that actually backfired, but it does show the pressure that mainstream media journalists are coming under. Having said that to you, um, we are going to short, shortly be um, reporting on more uh, uh, crass action by the BBC, um, who are, are cle have clearly shown the UK column that they are not interested in protecting children. I can't, I can't give you the details tonight, but I assure you we will be printing an amazing story where the BBC have shown once again that they don't care a fig for um, children who are being abused. And I think every time we can show up the mainstream media for their, for their weaknesses, good people, or their failings, good people inside the the press and the media uh, get a louder voice. Yeah, I couldn't agree from personal circumstances, Brian, on what you've said there. Um, you obviously know, I'm not going to go too much into detail on it, but um, the role that the local newspaper here in South Wales, the South Wales Evening Post played in, obviously, the Justice for Linda Lewis campaign. Well, I did bump into um, one of the journalists um, a few weeks back, not the same chap who came to the meeting that we had, where we had... Uh, you know, the local MP shouting and baying for blood outside. And I did manage to corner him, and he said to me, look, Kevin, we know everyone knows about the Linda Lewis case. We all would love to help you. We can't. If one of us mentions it, we would lose our job, and we have been told from the top that if we ever publish anything on this the way things are at the moment, the newspaper, even though it's the biggest circulation newspaper in South Wales, would close down more or less immediately. Um, again, one other thing, Brian, I've heard is um, it's not journalists and it's not necessarily editors that uh, run the press at the moment. Lawyers control the press for uh, protection over being sued. Would that be uh, a fair assessment? Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, the 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 more we've dealt into the child issue, the more it is becoming obvious that uh, the um, uh, the judiciary and and uh, the legal system is a key part of the trafficking and abuse of children. This is how they do it. This is how they steal the children from their parents. And um, uh, uh, so it's no surprise that the, the moment you get mainstream press and media that wants to report uh, the influences brought in through those legal teams to, to stop it happening. I, I have to say that we still do not have uh, more than a handful of solicitors and possibly one or two barristers across the whole country that we would trust as being straight and honest when it comes to these children's cases. Um, I think there are more who are basically okay, but they're weak. So the moment pressure comes on them, they buckle. But I believe that anybody now who says, oh, well, we can't do anything about this because of our job, you just say, so you condone it. You condone paedophiles. It's not good enough for people to say, it'll cost, him, it'll cost me my job. I'll come back to the Asian man on the front of the paper. That man stood up and repeatedly warned and did everything he could at the college, going to the police, 
to warn and stop horrific abuse of youngsters and what happened he was sacked he lost his job and I can tell you that uh, two weeks ago uh, he forced the finally forced the college into a tribunal for unfair dismissal the tribunal run by a judge no press no public and that judge um, absolutely refused to have any of his student witnesses come in to report on what was um, uh, what was done to them so the judge absolutely ran a kangaroo court to the extent that eventually the Asian guy walked out in disgust but there there you have it that man was prepared to do what was necessary including losing his job so I've got I've got less and less time now with people who say no no I can't do it because of my job or this will happen if you don't protect these children you are assisting the paedophiles that's what I think yeah I absolutely agree with you Brian and just um, for anybody in the room that doesn't know and I'm quoting your own figures which I agree um, child snatching by the state is a 20 billion pound a year industry all told and as far as the courts go nine out of ten uh, child care cases that enter court into bent courts for want of a better word um, always the judge will always rule um, as far as social services case go irrespective of the evidence of the parents so Brian I'm just going to move on I've got to ask this question or he'll never ever speak to me again I think we've touched briefly on it but the question is it's from Rick what inroads have been made with regards to a publishing arm for leaflets and pamphlets to be distributed to the public uh, well I'm gonna say when you ask me that question are you talk are you talking about the UK column or are you talking about um, British Constitution group well let's just say lawful rebellion the BCG the UK column because we're all sort of in it together and working together any ideas well I'm just going to say we, we're all for the idea now of leaflets for example leaflet a leaflet that you can hand to the police giving them background information and tell, you know, on what's going on and also what they need to know um, but I'm going to say very gently that at the moment um, as far as the UK column team goes we we just can't do any more at the moment what 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 we need is other people to take the initiative with this stuff design a leaflet um, and then let's see how we get the thing uh, printed and paid for and out but I can I have to say very gently a lot of people ask us on a weekly basis wouldn't it be a good idea to do this wouldn't it be a good yep they're all good ideas but we have not got the capacity to do more this is where we need little groups of people to take the initiative and do it when when we first started the UK column all we did is printed 500 a4 leaflets and they were talking about fraud and corruption in Plymouth and we stuck them out didn't know what would happen but what happened was the telephone started to ring and people began to gave us give us more information so my experience is that even 500 leaflets on a particular subject put around your local area can can have a you know a powerful effect yeah indeed thanks for that brian um we've got a volunteer somebody who's prepared to take the initiative a chap called rick um who i believe you have met so rick you've got it publishing arm you're going to take the initiative everybody's got you down we're, we're all witnesses to it and I presume you'll get in contact with Brian um, pretty soon so that's fine government and social services talk of reform how can we apply pressure for abolishing closed childcare courts into open ones and I might have to ask a second question I'll do it it's more or less the same how can we break the cartel that's being run by social services lawyers and family court judges at the moment well I think there's only one way to do this and that is total exposure of what we're really talking about there are still a lot of people out there who simply find it difficult to accept that these institutions are the ones actually taking and abusing and trafficking the children 
and this is this is w where we've got to stay we mustn't drift off with talking about reform of social services the moment you get into that area it all becomes a little bit woolly and gentlemanly we know that what is actually happening is the state is taking and trafficking and abusing children and senior government ministers are involved in it we have got to pin the label of the criminal abuse of children onto everybody we can the whole thing has got to be exploded um, something I, I forgot to check before coming on on with you guys tonight is what the result of the children vote children's referendum was in Ireland but I've no doubt it was a yes vote and what the what the Irish will have voted for is to effectively give the to give the Irish state primary control over children and I am told by people who are, are well up on what's moving behind the scenes in UK that that is exactly where they're going to go here they they are going to bring in some form of initiative which says that this child abuse is so terrible that the state needs to protect the children and if we let that happen then we we absolutely don't have a future I think the only way to do it is to stick on the trail of the paedophiles, people who are, are helping children being taken away from their parents in secret courts, people that are trafficking them, <coughs> police who are not doing their jobs, politicians are not doing their jobs. Um, they are, they are paedophiles themselves. The, the whole system's got to be smashed and we've got some interesting stuff happening at the moment because Italy has been criticizing the UK government for child stealing so Slovakia so is Germany um, sorry Italy Slovakia Germany and also Russia so we have absolutely you know got to go for this somebody's just posted that um, they did vote yes 58 in favor 42 percent against thank you Bertie um, if you look in the papers they will also tell you that there was absolute corruption over this referendum and money which shouldn't have been used for promoting the yes vote was so the Irish have absolutely given their children away to the paedophiles and that's what's going to happen in this country unless we expose it for what it is yeah I because I mean I, I strongly believe that uh, the time is now for basically hitting them out and of course we know that and uh, they know that Le leads on to one other question Brian um, how hard are our, are our enemies working to hide their crimes and how are they il il infiltrating us and distorting our message well they've been working exceptionally hard to hide their crimes because the the whole attack against us from the beginning in my opinion has been a covert attack it's been subversive so they they have said well <clears throat> we're not going to come onto the streets with guns and bullets we're going to attack people um, from the sidelines we're going to do things they can't see or can't understand and that is how the whole attack has been running um, it doesn't matter whether they've been stripping liberties away or they've been taking and abusing children it's all been done in the dark and I've pointed out in a couple of UK column articles the fact that uh, for ex example Jack Straw was instrumental in closing down all of the records where our security services were looking at, at agitators and disruptors in this country so about 250,000 records got scrapped of course Jack Straw uh, brother a paedophile um, son involved in drugs and Jack Straw was the man who introduced a law to make it uh, unlawful for children in care to speak out if they're being abused I wonder why you do that um, so everything they've done has been hidden and subversive and that is why just simply exposing what they're doing is such a powerful weapon um, there was another bit to the question sorry I've, I've missed that um, yeah okay Brian I think I've got that how hard are the enemies working to hide their crimes 
How are they infiltrating us and distorting our message? Um, right, well, uh, this is a really good question because it's one of the things that we're beginning to get very, very interested in. It, um, we, at the moment, believe, you know, and we don't say this lightly because we've been looking at it very carefully, um, that they are putting teams of people into monitoring websites and Facebook and, and Twitter and that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, these these people are specifically tasked to disrupt, to start fr um, fractiousness between people on these groups, um, to get in to spread false information, um, and the the government is spending a lot of money in this. Um, uh, you will remember a couple of years ago that MI5 was recruiting something like an extra 5,000 operatives um, and they wanted young people, obviously reasonably intelligent, but certainly computer literate. And I think these were teams of people to actually sit monitoring um, what all of the activist movement is up to. And having said that, this is one reason why we must never draw everything together in one organization. Everything that's done needs to be done in individual, in little cells and groups that stay very loose. And if there's a little bit of infighting and confusion, I think that's brilliant because it makes it very difficult for them. We know that some of the professional trolls are now using computer programs so that you can have one person creating multiple well you could have thousands but let's say one person creates 50 personalities which they then inject into um, a networking site and they use those computer driven personalities to spread disinformation and to try and skew the um, the information that's being passed around so there are some very very sophisticated attacks going on and people need to be very very careful excuse me when you get into chat rooms as to who 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 you're actually dealing with uh, the other if i just jump back to the other s subject about how frightened the other side is um uh, we have consistently asked Francis Maud and the Cabinet Office for disclosure, full disclosure of the emails showing the relationship between the Cabinet Office and Common Purpose. And I can tell you that the, the Cabinet Office absolutely refused to release those emails because if they did, it would show exactly what they're up to with Common Purpose. So Francis Maud, who promised transparency, um, is absolutely refusing to be transparent in releasing stuff under the Freedom of Information um, system. So why are they so frightened of releasing the information? Because we would see exactly what, you know, what they're doing. So they are terrified of exposure. And this is something which, which gives us a real um, tool to, you know, stick to beat them with. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that one, Brian. The one weapon that they seem to have, and it shows to me an air of desperation, is if you ask any MP, Welsh Assembly member, you get a campaign put together for mass email, you get no reply. Um, it seems to be that silence is their only answer, considering we're supposed to be a transparent and open country in government. Everything I've got is back as far as Linda's case, has come back as nothing. They all know about it. Um, thankfully, there's a couple of people inside the Welsh Assembly who uh, give me a drop of little leads. Um, they are terrified of the Linda Lewis case coming out, but uh, the Assembly members, the First Minister, the Head of Social Services, they all have uh, written into their job description that they must reply within 17 days but you never get a reply. So do you think silence is one of their weapons and it's a desperate one at the moment? One of their key weapons, and, and I'll just come back to the Oxford and Sherwell Valley College, is that the last article we, we wrote, we said that there was the deafening silence of a conspiracy. We have printed names and faces of people we've accused of being child abusers. We've We've talked about the head of the college, we've talked about councillors, we've talked about 
um, people in the safeguarding board and what have they done nothing have we had um, well we had a threat of legal action in the beginning since then there's silence uh, I sent um, an email to Thames Valley Police asking them to comment on our article where we've accused them and the Chief Constable of covering up. No reply, no reply, no reply. And this is because they can't. When you've got enough evidence against them, they're pinned to the wall. But I think what, what we've got to do is the names and faces have got to appear everywhere. So in in we've we've got the situation and you'll give an example you're pushing out stuff about Lin, linda lewis case and there's no reply from people who should reply then the name and face of that person and a brief summary of what they're doing which is protecting child abusers needs to start appearing and 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 i believe that that stickers on lamp posts and doc and and leaflets through people's doors very powerful but the common the, the mistake we mustn't make is for one or two people to do all the work because they then get branded as vexatious or threatening or whatever you need teams of people to do a little bit so you spread it out in the area but you make sure that a lot of people are just doing one or two so that they can't pull their push their finger at, at, at just one or two individuals and the other thing that I know has gone on uh, very very successfully in South Wales is the idea of a whispering campaign so that you start to talk about these individuals when you go and fill up your car with petrol you talk to the girl you know at the cash desk you talk to people in your local community now this has been done in a particular area of Wales and the results have been fantastic that whole village communities are now abs absolutely on board with what these people are doing and and ultimately the psychological impact on these people can be very very powerful you will find that they suddenly leave their jobs or you know some of them are going to have breakdowns because they know that what they're doing is wrong so we silence is a weapon you've got to counter it by actually not letting them get away with silence if the MPs are not replying to an email it needs people to turn up at their surgeries not the same people but every week there's a surgery somebody turns up to talk about the same subject and take a, vo a recorder uh, record voice record video and then we can get the films up on the internet or we can get them out on UK column live that sort of thing yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Brian. That that's great because I'll tell you why. That's something that uh, we've been talking about down in this area as far as Linda's case goes. Uh, just a quick message. We're making very good time, and I hope everybody's okay with how it's going. Um, a lot of questions have come in, Brian, that uh, I haven't had a chance to ask yet. So I'm just going to stick to the script that I've got um, based on questions from from yesterday. Keep pumping the questions into the room. We will get them. As I said, we're making good time. I'll try and get to them when I can. And uh, the way we go in, everything's going to be fine. Hopefully, Brian uh, has more or less agreed, and I don't think he's changed his mind. We haven't scared him that much. That we can come down to an open mic session um, once we're through with the agenda set in front of me. So we'll carry on. Brian, what we were talking about there, um, about infiltration and distorting of the message. Numerous blogs, blog spots are now claiming that Holly Gregg is a scam the whole holly greg thing is a scam i know the truth what's your thoughts on that please well my simple answer to that one is watch um last thursday's uk column live interview um where i had patrick henningson with me we initially started off <coughs> excuse me talking about the bbc and savile but then um i went into an interview with uh, robert green in which we put up documentary evidence um, showing that Holly Gregg had been abused we were not prepared to put up all the evidence because that would be a stupid thing to do um, since that evidence is still needed to hit the authorities at the right time but we put up very simple overwhelming documentary evidence that that um, girl had been abused 
we put up um, uh, documents from the police, we put up documents from um, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists uh, and other bodies all saying that that girl had been abused. Um, we, we also, I'm going to say, I also hold detailed evidence as to what the police did and found and discovered in the initial interviews. There's no ifs and buts. That young girl was badly abused and she then, um, as, as basically the story started to come out, she told more and more in greater and greater detail about the people who had abused her. And at the end of the interview, if you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to watch it because at the end of the interview, we get on the subject to BBC Scotland, who also said that from the information they had seen and in talking to Holly and her mother Anne, they were convinced that Holly had been abused and they were going to run a, an investigative programme and it was going to go through to Panorama. And then a few weeks later, all of a sudden, they dropped the whole case trying to claim because Anne had been in a mental institution. Now, there's two things to note here is that one, uh, whether or not Anne had been in a mental institution didn't make a jot of difference to what the, the evidence was coming out of, Ho of Holly's mouth because she was describing the abuse. And yes, Anne did end up in a mental institution because that is what they do with mothers and fathers who don't shut up and try and get justice for themselves and their children or try and protect their children. So Anne was put in a psychiatric unit to shut her up. That's a common procedure. Holly Barker, who we've re recently flagged up as another mother trying to protect her daughter from abuse, has been sectioned and put in a psychiatric unit in Oxford. And I can tell you a very good friend of mine, Kevin in Ireland, um, uh, has had, he and his wife have had two boys taken away from them. Uh, uh, they'd run to Ireland to try and protect those children. English social services eventually were able to take the two boys. They were flown out of Ireland and have never been seen since. Kevin was also um, banged up in a psychiatric unit for a while to try and shut him up. So the Holly Gregg case is absolutely correct. The abuse was by multiple people, including members of the establishment. And that is why there has been this absolutely massive campaign to try and di uh, discredit the whole case. It's real. I believed in it from the beginning. I still believe in it. I still hold the real evidence, as does Robert Green and, of course, Anne herself, um, that Holly was abused. And the fact we have people like um, Eileen Shangelini, who in, under a maiden name was prepared to write reports making it easier for men north of the border to sodomize young boys. Um, how much more evidence do people need as to what's what's really going on? Yeah, I agree. Um, that That's how the state can work. You've either got lunatics and nutters out there or people acting on the state, the state purely for disinformation. I mean, I have met Robert Green. I met him at that uh, meeting he had in Stoke, I think, last year or the year before. And he couldn't meet a more genuine, honest bloke, in my opinion. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, the Holly Gregg case, I've seen the evidence, etc. is perfectly true. Right, Brian, a little bit of light humour here. We're going back. Um, infiltration and distortion of the message. Are you aware that on uh, Digger for Truth website, there's a claims that Brian Gerrish is a shill and gives 10 reasons why? Have you seen it? Yes, I've, I've certainly seen it. I can't remember all the ten reasons, but if anybody wants to ask me the ten, I'll, I'll answer each one. So I don't think we need to go through all ten, but just quickly three of them. Are uh, you not related then to Lord Kitchener? Are you a member of Scientology? And do you uh, do anything funny with doves? Uh, well, look, the, um, the Lord Kitchener one, um, we, from, from the outset, we have had... Um, members of the public donating to us um, 
that's how we get our money we don't take any money from any groups or organizations the money that's donated it just comes in from the public is it true that an elderly lady who has given us money is um, related to the Kitchener family absolutely yes that's correct and I find it unbelievably pathetic that because um, somebody's come from that family um, and they as an elderly lady they have my goodness done so much to try and support um, all and everybody who's been fighting for the country for some idiot to now try and brand her as as being um, you know bad or evil because because she she's got family connections with the Kitchener line I just find pathetic but yes it's true um, what isn't true is that the only place we get money from is the Kitchener family that's crap that's fair point Brian we, we all don't we've all seen it and we all basically had a laugh at it it's just nonsense um, quick question on it uh, do you know who runs it Brian and uh, just basically coming on from that how much do you find yourself under attack um, okay well there's a number of questions here you asked me two others the dove one um, that we used on the lawful rebellion you know putting it on the Union Jack um, we made a decision I, I know that the dove um, is, is used by the other side in their symbology but we, we took a decision that we can't let the other side run the show so um, I suspect that some of the people in this chat room will know that of course the Union Jack was twisted to become a sort of vicious right-wing symbol well that's the other side doing that it's our national flag we should be proud of it so we use it so we decided we just wouldn't give in to this business that well because you can go and look at a, an Illuminati document or a UN document and they've got a particular image on it that we can't use that image if it's a perfectly north normal thing it's a dove it's a sign of peace somebody's pointed that up on the screen and we said let's let's reclaim the dove most people think of the dove as being something nice to do with peace we will put it on our national flag so that's how we treated that um uh, what did you mention scientology I will tell you where the the thing about Scientology has come from there's an organization called the Citizens Commission on Human Rights um, many years ago probably five or six um, I contacted them without knowing too much about them but I contacted them because they were producing brilliant information exposing the scam of psychiatry and they were also doing a lot of work to help people who had been for example uh, wrongly sectioned or were being bullied or false reports were being written on them by psychiatrists and um, I've forgotten his surname but there's another Brian in that organization they were they were absolutely brilliant and I gave them information on common purpose and they gave me a lot of very good information to do with the psychiatric system uh, they produce excellent DVDs and books now when when we'd exchanged the first bit of information Brian said to me totally openly I so he said to me I think you should know that we get funding um, from the Scientologists now I was more interested in the quality of information that I was being given um, but that was freely admitted and I have made a decision that I am prepared to work with people who seem to me to be going in the right direction and if I can quantify this I get people who, who say to me uh, well of course that person's a Catholic well the Vatican's bad so you shouldn't deal with that person because they're a Catholic to which I say well that's not how I'm going to work I'm going to deal with the individuals I've had many people say to me you mustn't talk to that person because they're BMP or ex BMP well I'm not going to do that and I get people who say don't talk to the Muslims and I'm not going to do that so the the sideways swipe about Scientology has come because uh, from the fact that I do talk and exchange information with the Citizens Commission on Human Rights
Yeah, Brian, I can accept all that. Um, I think somebody put a comment in that um, only MI5 would know that. The next set of question I was going to ask you on it just very quickly is, do you who, do you know who runs that website? No, I don't know who runs Truth Digger. The other one that was carrying it is, um, oh, it's just gone out of my head now, Truth Seeker. I'm told the person who runs Truth Seeker is an extreme Christian and not a nice piece of work. Um, I actually sent Truth Seeker an email saying, would you like to back up what you're saying with some fact? And I didn't even get a reply. So um, I know where all this dirt has come from. The dirt has come from um, a lady called Mel V, who thought she was very clever by um, trying to claim that I had a brother who um, was working for the Rothschild simply because he had the same surname and um, that was the start of a very big attack on me and the UK column I believe to try and completely undermine the Holly Gregg campaign. Okay just the the final small question to to this Brian how much do you find yourself under attack? Um, well if if I'm dealing with people face to face so let's say people are emailing me or telephoning me or the talks or, and all those sorts of things we're not getting any attacks at all um, but what is clear over the last probably the last sort of four or five months is that the internet attacks have been in increasing and I think this is because we are now starting to really hurt the other side I think if you if you have a look at my name on Wikipedia or um, uh, what's the other wiki can't remember there's two versions of wiki um, but you'll see it's talking about my paranoia with common purpose so I, I think these people are, are really trying to hit me and and of course other people speaking out you know Ian Crane is finding it um, it just tells me that we're beginning to really hurt them so it doesn't upset me this is the nature of the game um, it tells me that, that we're doing the right things. Yeah, as the saying goes, Brian, you're not getting flack unless you're over the target. So moving on, a very simple question about uh, the way things are in the country, the economy, etc. Where is all the money going? Um, well, you'd be better talking to Mike Robinson about, about this one because the money's more, more his field. But what I think is, is happening is that is that money is inherently being sucked back into the banking pot this is what the whole balloon is about that uh, as the economic system financial economic system starts to collapse it collapses because more and more money is needed in order to hold up the whole fraudulent scam and pay all the interest back so the system itself is sucking in money but I also believe now that we are looking at a criminal government and and that's cross party so it doesn't matter whether we're looking back at, at Harold Wilson or Blair that that are they are running criminal scams on on a financial scale which is breathtaking I don't think that they're scamming a few tens of millions they're scamming uh, hundreds of millions in deals on drugs, weapons, vaccines, the, uh, the NHS, the whole lot. So I, I think the the criminal cartel running this country is running global um, criminal networks, which is sucking in billions of pounds. Um, you you've just mentioned 20 billion in relation to the children issue. Well, that's just the children. What's happening in the NHS? Um, you know, what's happening with road tax? I, th I think they are working on scams, multi, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds, billions of pounds. OK, thanks again, Brian. Uh, moving on nicely, just changing the subject um, once more. Are you OK at the moment to keep going? Yes, yeah, fine. OK, next question is, are you aware that before they reopen the investigation into North Wales and Liverpool children's homes, care home owners have written private cheques of compensation to their children. Do you think this is an admission of guilt? Yeah, well, my immediate answer is yes. 
Um, uh, a very good example of this um, is um, pinned down. I mentioned the lady's name. It's now going to go out of my head. Um, but it was to do with with the abuse of girls. Well, there were some boys as well, young teenagers, who who. Sorry, um, I'll start again. Um, there's a book called Pin Down. Teresa Cooper is the lady. Uh, she was abused to, together with other young women and boys. They, they were sedated, unconscious for days and raped and buggered. Uh, that was in a Church of England home. Um, even though she had all of the evidence and corroborating evidence from other um, youngsters who were in that home with her, she had medical records, she had visitor books, she had everything. The police did nothing. But eventually the Church of England uh, paid her compensation. But this is the way it's always done. You buy off the victim or you try and buy off the victim. You don't actually bring the perpetrators to justice. So if you're telling me that people have been paying out money, they're guilty, they know they're guilty, and they're simply buying off the victims. Yeah, that seems to be the case. Um, a couple of other things that have come to light, Brian, I don't know if you're aware of it, but obviously there was an investigation into the Freemasonry side um, when they did the first investigation, and that was poo-pooed as uh, not being relevant or there was no free Freemasonry involvement. It has come to light now that one of the barristers involved, um, his name is Jared Elias, who is the uh, QC, whose brother was the chap, you remember, who did the illegal operation on Linda's daughter. Documentation is now out there, mate, that uh, he is actually a member of one of the biggest um, Masonic lodges in Cardiff. So that's going to be quite interesting as well. And um, quick question, just to finish that one. Do you think this will be another cover-up, cover or will we get somewhere? I think it will be a cover-up, unless we and as many people as possible as possible actually get and keep the spotlight on what this is all about we we've got we there's a crack in the system now and we've got to keep hammering the wedges in if we just let the establishment quietly get on with this investigation like they they always do they will completely um, um, you know put a cover over it smoke screen and nothing will get done. We have got the evidence now that there is massive abuse of children. I've just one statistic for anybody in the room who still is not sure about this. You go away and check it yourselves. But all the research I did said that 30,000 children are simply disappearing each year in this country. These are not children who go into the care system and then disappear. These are children just disappearing themselves. And the little girl that, who was unfortunately taken recently in Wales, um, even, I think it was the BBC, mentioned that 500 children are abducted in Britain every year. Question, why does this not come up on the TV? Because it means that we should be running at sort of, you know, whatever it is, 18, 19, 20 uh, of these cases a month so the scale of the trafficking and abuse of children is massive and that's what we've got to stay focused on so any of the MPs or members of the Welsh Assembly who are or, or who are involved or should be involved have got to be pinned down with the reality of what we're talking about we've got to stay on the big picture and not get distracted that doesn't mean to say we're not going to fight individual cases. We absolutely should. But we've got to stay on what we're really talking about, which is tens of thousands of British children being taken, a, a trafficked, abused, sold. Yes, of course. And if they get their way, these numbers will dramatically increase. Next question, Brian, is I would like Brian's opinion on the reforms that government is making to empower social services to remove children from their parents faster than they have done before. Same sort of line. Well, I, again, I think in a way this is a, a sign that we're having an effect because 
uh, at the moment more and more people are fighting the cases they're not they're not unfortunately able to hang on to the children but for the first time in the courts people are now fighting they're calling the cor the courts corrupt they're pointing out the fact that um, psychiatric or clinical psychology reports are fabricated so there's a, there's a battle going on and to me it's not surprising that here's the state saying oh we've got to speed the whole process up because once they've got the, chil the child away for fostering or, adu or adoption the chance of getting that child back are very very remote so they are they want to speed the process up where they where they want to get to in this country is that every child is the property of the state and they can do what they want with the child social workers are being given more and more power because effectively they are the link into the psychiatric system and the most dangerous social workers are the, the ones who they call mentally health approved mental health approved these are the people who can turn up with the sectioning teams if you look at um, Stalinist Russia if you look at East Germany if you look at Nazi Germany um, the psychiatric system was absolutely used as the weapon of the state if you challenge the state if you're speaking out somebody's trying to brand you mentally ill and they want to get you in a, a psychiatric unit who are the people who are going to do this social workers and in my opinion this is why they've now started to bring in foreign social workers and I know that in South Wales in particular there are Americans Canadians East European social workers you want foreigners because they have no basic empathy for the British people they'll be dealing with so they want to speed the process up they want to give social workers more power and if there's anybody in the room who still doesn't understand what the MAPA system is the multi-agency public protection arrangement where a whole range of official bodies sit behind closed doors and discuss who is a problem in their area you need to research this pretty quickly because it's it it's frightening when you understand the power of these people who are totally unaccountable you go and cause a problem on your own and they can get close to you you are moving step by step down the route of being sectioned yeah well i think i'm pleased to announce that i'm on mapa in this area brian as well as a few people i know um it's it's been made perfectly obvious by all three main parties that they are now taking a lot of their doctrine from saul alinsky rule for radicals which is another thing i suggest people look up and um, exactly the same stuff is happening in social services as exactly what uh, Saul Alinsky uh, put down in his rules for radicals would you agree yeah I would agree with this and and I would also say <clears throat> if people haven't started to look at um, Saul Alinsky's material please do because not only does it explain what's happening in this country and how it's being done Saul Alinsky actually gives us um, the means to fight back against it because we can use exactly the techniques he's talking about in order to bring down the other people and that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm focusing on this business and making it personal if the council in your area is causing you and other people trouble don't talk about the council name the people name the chief executive name the councillors so this is Saul Alinsky's tactics but if you look at his book rules for radicals which is on the internet you can download it as a PDF you will find it is dedicated it's dedicated to Lucifer and this this is no accident sometimes people say to me well how bad are these people and I'll say well imagine the Nazis and then add a bit these people are absolutely dangerous and they're now peddling an ideology which they can promote by very sophisticated behavioral change methods but research Alinsky um, UK column has produced papers um, documents which show without any doubt that um, both the Conservatives Lib Dem and Labour are using Saul Alinsky policy
Yeah, thanks, Brian. I mean, I, I can basically agree with everything you said as far as making it personal. Um, you might recall the social worker who actually did the child kidnapping in America, Julie Resnicek. Uh, she was forced to leave Neathbutt Albert Council about one year back. The reason given was um, that it was uh, a mutual parting of the ways. Um, I basically put all my attacks onto Julie Resnicek and the reason, the truth, or the truthful reason that she actually left social services in Heathbutt Albert was that she was an embarrassment and the amount of attacks she was getting, they were getting associated with that and they basically wanted her off, uh, off the books and off the hands. But I've got one more question, Brian, for the time being. Is there some sort of manifesto or document that compactly states what is going on and the solutions to it all? The answer to that is at the moment there isn't, um, but one of the things that we are working on at the moment for UK Column Live is to, to do exactly this, to talk through what's happening um, as a, you know, step by step, just as if we're analysing a battle and then putting up um, solutions. But yeah, we need some help in getting this into documentary form. It, it all comes down to hands and, and capability. But we think because people are waking up and asking questions, they're hungry to know what to do about it. And so if we could, um, uh, there used to be some sort of anarchist guides um, that uh, became quite popular with you young people well we don't want to be anarchists but what we what we can push out is um is is guides to how people can take the right sort of action to deal with this okay brian thanks for that just one quick one that uh, has just come through we're going back to the jimmy savile case uh, the question is how was jimmy savile allowed to go into hospitals and why were nurses telling uh, the children to pretend they were sleeping how come it never came out well, I think the simple answer to this is because the people we're dealing with are very powerful and they they know how to threaten, bully and intimidate people to, to shut them up. Um, I've had two, um, a mother and a, a daughter, um, two very nice black ladies. Um, the daughter was um, training to be a doctor at King's College in London and... Um, in one of the psyche wards she was she picked up that that patients were talking about being abused now she said it, it was a difficult thing to deal with because some of the patients were schizophrenic some of them had quite serious problems but she said there was a pattern in what these patients would talk about so eventually she wrote uh, having done one of the uh, one of her tours of duty on the ward she wrote in in the uh, medical records of some of the patients what they were talking about within a couple of days those notes had disappeared out of the records and within a few weeks she was being su subjected to the most vicious uh, attacks on her bullying psychological attacks and we, we're going to stick with the story because it ends up with senior people in King's College London saying to the mother, well, maybe you should move out of the country. So these are very dangerous, powerful people. And um, uh, I can imagine that the word would have got round that hospital very quickly. You want to keep your job, you keep your mouth shut. And of course, it is easy to say, well, which comes first, the safety of the children, you know, or your job but people have got to feed themselves. So I, I think it's down to the the power of the people we're up against. And of course, <clears throat> I think I'm right in saying at the time that Jimmy Savile was able to get into these medical institutions, Ken Clark was the man in charge. You can draw your own conclusions to that. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thanks for that, Brian. Right, Brian, I've actually reached uh, the end of all the questions that I've been given um, through my blog spot and ones we had on the abortion, uh, the aborted uh, attempt last night. Um, are you happy for another half hour where you can take some questions from the room? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Brian, do, do you need a five minute break or, or anything before we go on? No, I'd, I'd rather go for it and um, 
I, I, I've enjoyed it. After we've done the questions, I shall be away because I've got an early start in the morning. Okay, Brian, uh, three people waiting in line. I'll just hand yeah. over to V for Vendetta. After that, it's Honey Pot, then Rebel, Rebel Rick. Yeah, good evening, Brian. Hope you can hear me okay. Thank you for coming in the room. Very, very good information tonight. My question is, Brian, can we expect to see any kind of numbers of peace officers being sworn in within the, the near future? And if so, can there be any um, arrests being taken on the grounds of treason? That's my question. Um, right, with the peace officer bit, I've got some catching up to do because this has primarily been something that um, uh, John, um, ex-policeman John Hurst has been helping with. Um, on the 24th of this month, we got another British Constitution meeting and um, we want to bring out this sort of stuff. We want to talk about actions. And, and I believe that we need now more, a greater focus on the idea of the peace officers. In Ireland, they are getting a very good effect by, um, I forget what they're, they're calling them. They're not calling them peace officers, but they're calling them sort of public assistants. And they are people who are turning up on the doorstep if people have got the bailiffs there or some other form of trouble and it's proving to be very very effective so i i would like to see a much bigger effort now in getting these people trained um but i'm going to say i am not the person taking the lead and we need we do need to get an update of how the those guys are getting on john hurst has been one of the key ones um uh, with regard to arrests, um, uh, it would be nice to see more arrests, but I'm quite sure that even a properly executed um, public citizen's arrest um, will be treated as assault by the system at the moment because they're so frightened of it. I, it's only a personal view, so you know if you disagree, that that's absolutely f fine. Um, uh, what I I think is more powerful is that we start to set up the common law courts and the grand juries and we actually try people if they don't turn up and of course in most cases they're not going to turn up they're tried in their absence and then what those people have hanging over their heads is the fear that at some time in the future people are going to come looking for them. Um, so I believe that setting up the courts uh, with ordinary people, it's got to be done absolutely perfect, perfectly, accurately and in a very measured way. But I think that is a very powerful weapon. OK, well, I was, I was thinking more of the um, those that can be named and shamed as who are actually are, are guilty of treason. And we could mention some quite pretty high up officials in this case. Well, yeah, I've got to say it's a good idea. Um, certainly, we know that the judge who was presiding at uh, Birkenhead within within a matter of weeks had retired as a judge. The shock of what happened to him in that in that court was enough for him to actually step down. Um, thank you very much for the mic time. I assume you finished answering that question. Um, I'd just like to say um, it's been an absolute exhilarating night, Brian, listening to you. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I personally, um, I wanted to ask you about, um, I, I've been writing certain articles following the mental health, following children's rights and so on, and I have found it more increasingly difficult over the last three years to get information which is supposed to be in the public domain and that is becoming more increasingly um, frustrating for myself. Have you also found this to be the situation yourself? That, that's what I wanted to know because I'm, I'm finding that things that should be in the public domain really isn't there and when it is there it's out to date you know um yeah we we are certainly finding this and it comes back to the fact that the other side 
is getting more and more frightened um, at the amount of information people are now digging into. I, I don't think they really understood what the effect, for example, of the Freedom of Information Act would be. I think they thought that that was just a sop to the general public to keep them happy when in fact more and more people have been able to use it as a very powerful weapon to get information out. But I, I know many people who are doing a lot of freedom of information um, requests as an example and very often they are now being fobbed off. The council simply refuse to answer and I can also tell you that uh, I'll come back to this business of the cabinet office and common purpose they are breaking every rule in the book to stop passing out the, the information. Why are they so frightened? Because that information will do them huge, huge damage. Yeah, good evening. Thanks for your time tonight. Uh, listening to what's been going on this evening, uh, would it not be beneficial to all of us if we started some sort of networking up across the UK where groups in different parts of the country could uh, liaise with one another um, get information coordinated together, passing it about, uh, working concertedly and together to try and get this thing brought down. You know, it, 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 I'm talking about the paedophiles mainly at, the, at this point. And it would also help, you know, having a network across the country on times like you just mentioned where someone had a bailiff turn up at the door and she had many, many friends turn up to a sister. Well this is based similar to a guy in uh, Alaska, Schaefer Cox, who set up his own network of police that worked alongside the national police. That when any of the uh, local inhabitants were hassled, his local force would turn up to support them. And this sort of thing could be uh, set up if we was this try and set up some sort of uh, networking across the UK. Yeah, well, I think this is the right idea. But I say to you that, that there, there are networks across the UK at the moment. Some, something I did in the early days was just got a map and started to plot on it uh, locations for people who were doing things or helping us. And I, I've still got that map. And it, and it still makes a huge difference. So I'd say for all of the little groups, it isn't just a question of, you know, knowing email addresses of other people across the country. Have a look at it on a map, pl plot it on a map. And also you've got to know the people you're talking to, what their skills and specialist areas are, and then get those uh, get those people talking to each other. We We still spend a lot of time doing that and that's how the network is set up. I can, in my head now, I can be thinking about Newcastle, for example, and I, I know five or six key people there, and I know they're dealing with other people, the same in South Wales, the same down in Cornwall. But I see a lot of people at the moment, they, they, they're talking to a lot of other people via email networks, but they don't look at it from the point of view of how many people have we got in Bristol, how many people are there down in somewhere else. The political parties used to do it, but we need to do this on a fairly loose system. Um, but I think that if, if, if we can get some of these leaflets and these little booklets on what to do, then that will help the individual groups start to train people up. If you've got people who are interested in Somebody's put up the Liberty Bell system, you know, this this system of getting people to respond when people need help. I think this is a very powerful idea. But if we've just got a little, um, if we've got a booklet on it, that can be spread around the groups. But I see that there's a very, very powerful uh, network already operating across the country. My question was going to be about the new tax, council tax benefits, right, which are being cut now the poorest people in society 
are now being forced to pay council tax uh, on on top of all their other bills on top of the fact that we sold all the en energy companies so we're now having to pay 20 percent extra a year on electricity gas and water and that type of thing I mean, let's not even get into that but i'm just on about the council tax thing issue yeah because the thing i found with my council tax area yeah they're only getting a 10 percent shortfall in the council tax uh, benefit allowance for all the people who are on the dole or whatever who are exempt right but they're then asking all the people who are on the dole for a 20 percent uh, <laughs> for 20 percent of the uh, council tax which hang on a minute if there is only a 10 percent shortfall then surely if they're asking for 20 percent then they're trying to make a profit out of it that's the way I see it anyway well, well I would agree with that they're trying to make a profit out of everything but the other the other thing which they're going flat out to do at the moment is to reduce everybody to abject poverty so the trick at the moment is that they are taxing people who can't afford to pay anything more than they're taxing people at the top end of the scale and why do you want to do this because at the end of the day they want to reduce this country to chaos and they want to have people at each other's throats so the the moment something's going on and you feel angry about it that is exactly why the other side is doing it they don't want us to be able to afford our own how ha uh, housing never mind your own house but housing they don't want people to be able to feed themselves they want people to be reduced to a groveling poverty and that is the right environment to stir up violence on the streets so all of this stuff makes sense when you say well this is not common sense no it is common sense because what they are doing is absolutely messing up everybody's lives Plymouth City Council is where I started looking at fraud and corruption millions of pounds of money being squandered and given away unlawfully so this is going on in Sheffield all the major cities it's not just a question they haven't got money the money they've got they're not using properly because of the criminal activity I tell you that looking back for me if I go back sort of what eight or nine years ago I knew we had to fight and you start doing things but I really couldn't see how we could turn this thing over now and particularly the last couple of years I can absolutely see how it can be brought down because I think that once it starts to go it's going to implode almost from its own weight and it, it's incredible now the speed at which information is moving around not only in UK but over you know to America or Australia but of course it's the internet that's allowing this to happen and we can be sure that these people are going to target the internet I think if we all gear up we um, we do as much as we can however we can do it wherever we can do it and this business that we've got to work with people I don't agree with everybody um, people don't agree with everything you know I think is right but if we agree on 60% we've got to push forward and I think this thing can be brought down and the other thing that um, that I think and just put it into context why do I keep talking about the children and the answer for this is not only because they're children but there isn't anything more serious at the moment you can talk about fraud and corruption you can talk about the European Union you can talk about tasers you can talk about tons of stuff but if you talk about sexual abuse torture and murder of children that is what's being done that is the seat of it and if we can focus on that and show what these people are the system is going to fall I, I I think we are approaching a really exciting time because you can see the beast is having to come out of the woodwork now and we need to be able to see it in order to actually destroy it so I'm gonna say for the first time we are starting to win but we've got a long way to go
Brian, excellent, mate. I'm just going to come in to finish with, as a country, if we can't protect our own children, we should all be ashamed of ourselves. So anyway, Brian, it took 24 hours later than expected. I'd like to thank you on behalf of everybody in the room for coming in. You know where we are now, Lawful Rebellion UK, it's open. Please don't be a stranger in future, mate. Come in any time. And once again, on behalf of everybody who's listened to you, Brian, many, many thanks indeed. And we'll speak soon. Okay, well, thank you, Kevin and, and everybody else. Um, we've got a big job to do. And it's, it's group, you know, it's groups like yours and, and other groups around the country. That's where the power is at the moment. We've really got to keep pushing. And um, I, I think something very interesting is going to happen if we keep identifying these criminals in power. Um, something is going to give fairly shortly, and I, I think it's going to be quite spectacular when it goes. Okay, excellent, Brian. Once again, thanks very much indeed, mate. As I say, don't be a stranger, and anybody who's in the room, you don't have to go anywhere. I'm sure once Brian's gone off and had his cup of tea and got ready for bed, um, discussion will continue. So, Brian, once again, on behalf of the roommate, thanks very much indeed.